I don't need a mouse. No. No. I, I'm fine with this. Oh, wow. People are coming in. And uh, we'll just wait till you sit down and uh, uh, like you do a big question. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Okay, good. Oh. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jens Mernig. I'm a researcher with SAP, um, and this is my friend and colleague uh, Bernard Romagoza, a researcher uh, with Arduino, and we'll be presenting a uh, graphical programming language um, that we're working on uh, together with uh, our uh, friend Brian Harvey, who's a, a professor at UC Berkeley, and the language is called SNAP, uh, which is kind of a, gener a gener generic name, um, and it's got the name Build Your Own Blocks. Um, uh, so what is SNAP about? SNAP is, any, anybody know Scratch? The language Scratch, who, who knows Scratch? Awesome, you all just know Scratch. Anybody know SNAP? <laughs> okay, great. So I'm going to show you something new. Okay, SNAP has been created for a new course at UC Berkeley that's in place now for uh, six years. Uh, they replaced the old CS10 course, which is uh, the, the introductory computer science course for non-CS majors, um, with a new course uh, that's called The Beauty and Joy of Computing. And, you know, just changing the name and switching over to a language that is more accessible um, has kind of, um, you know, attracted more underrepresented minorities to the course. So for the first time in, in UC Berkeley history, actually the course has a higher number of females than males in that course. And that's partly uh, because formally it was uh, named Introduction to um, Symbolic Programming. And so names matter and accessibility is something that is not just, you know, for disability issues but also for regular people. Uh, so the development of SNAP, SNAP has been for a long time kind of my side project as, as I was a programmer and lawyer for, for another company. But then we got kind of lucky. We got some funding from the National Science Foundation. We got my employers to kind of you know, fund it and let me work on it. It's been Neosoft and now SAP and Y Combinator also. Um, there is a curriculum, um, the Beauty and Joy of Computing curriculum that's been developed at UC Berkeley and now at um, Nationwide at uh, uh, Education Development Center. Um, and it's also an APCS principles course, that's a kind of new kind of uh, course in the United States that's sort of like a centralized, standardized course for the big ideas in computer science and BJC, the acronym for Beauty of Computing, is part of that, is, is, is one of these courses and since October now, since the last semester, uh, we're kind of dissipating it nationwide. There's a MOOC, a MOOC on edX, um, uh, that's, uh, and there's a, a project to bring this course to uh, 100 high schools in New York City, and we've been working with them for the last year. Um, and they're kind of using this course and also using this language. So the language, which is why we're here, it's web browser based. It's pure HTML. JavaScript, so it runs in the browser. It doesn't have to be installed, which is a problem. The schools, if you try to install software, sometimes they won't let you. Um, it's been translated right now into 39 languages, most European languages, but also some Asian ones. Um, it's, of course, free in Libre and open source, so it's all on, on GitHub. You can fork it, and people have forked it a lot. Um, uh, there's also a free cloud service, so you can, so kids can, you know, in school, start a project and then continue working at home by, uh, you know, just logging into the cloud or, or keep working on it on their iPads. Um, and it's used as a teaching and research platform in, in many um, uh, institutions. So, um, kind of... Our colleague, Brian Harvey, um, coined this term that SNAP, which is our language, is basically scheme, um, but it looks like scratch. Um, so what does that mean? Um, so from scratch, we're taking, you know, these 
blocks that stick together, that prevent syntax errors, um, that look inviting. We've got the 2D cartoonish micro world where there are sprites that can move around. They're against a backdrop, which is called the stage. We've got, uh, you know, the, the, the parallelism from, from scratch where things can go at the same time. You don't have to think at the level of ticks in order to make things move, but you, you have actual, you know, threads and processes. Um, and it's one of the most important things. It's interactive. It's constantly live. There is no compiling run cycle, but wherever you click on a block, it, you know, it immediately happens. And I'm going to show some of that liveness, which is important to make something self-discoverable. Um, and so, so you don't have to Google how does it work. You can just try it, you know, in a safe <laughs> environment. So this makes for a low floor, as we say. It's 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 an easy access. It gets you started, um, but it's also a scheme. This guy's scratch. So from scheme, we're taking the ability to, you know, not just use the blocks that we give you, but also it's an extensible language. You can build your own blocks. You can build any blocks, and by any, I mean you can even build kind of control structures. It's uh, dynamically typed, uh, so so we've got heterogeneous data structures, uh, and we've got lexically scoped um, variables, which uh, kind of um, allows us to um, to kind of do real computer science. You know, uh, we have some first class stuff, including first class lists, lists of lists that allow us to build any model, any data structures, and we've got a way to think about blocks using blocks, which is essentially Lambda. Um, so, so we've got Lambda and, and Lambda capturing non-local state of variables. And that also allows us to not just model any data structure, but to model any control structure. Basically, kind of build your own programming language in blocks. And we've got some fun stuff like first class continuations, just because we're talking about a scheme, which kind of allows for us to, to build our own like um, um, uh, break uh, things and, and, and non-local exit um, control structures. And because we're encouraging students to um, use this language to build their own control structures, um, we have proper tail recursion. So, so they can model it recursively, because that's uh, a, a powerful idea to think about and to learn. So, so this is basically the old battle cry of the logo community, right? So we got the low four, but we have no ceiling. We do have a ceiling. You know, technically, you can't do everything with Snap. But conceptually, Anything and everything that you can express in a programming language, we want to be able to express in this kind of, you know, kids looking like language. Um, so there are some other things that we, you know, took from other environments that inspired us, like Smalltalk, Logo, and, and Self. So we've got more first class stuff. We've got more ways to work with uh, data. We, we've got web API, so, so kids can play with robots and drones and, and, and stuff. It's extensible with JavaScript, so you've got a way to kind of write your own blocks. And even if, you know, it doesn't exist yet, if you need primitives, um, um, we, we can transpile and, and compile the blocks to other languages. So we can embed it on, you know, little robots because some some of these like Arduino's they they really enjoy uh, having their sketches kind of natively because they're low powered machines, and we can deploy um, these things as native apps also. And and this is basically what we call wider walls. So these are the three dimensions that we're talking about: low floor, low entry, no ceiling. So you can stick to you know Snap and do your PhD in Snap. But there's also a wide variety of things, and there's usually more than one way to do one thing. So 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 we're very. Um, encouraging people not to just to think this is the right way you can do it, but there are different ways and they should all work. So, oh yeah, let me show you. Um, <laughs> okay, good. What's happening? I didn't get my Mac. So this is, anybody seen this? This is kind of a project that started it all. Um, it's called V and what this is, is it's a, it's a little project and, and here's an example of a custom block. And this is uh, how we define the block V. So on the stage, what we have is what every scratch kit will identify as a list watcher. It's, it's a list. Only in the list, there are blocks. And this is something provocative. This is something Scratch doesn't give you. So here we have this function V. And I've kind of slowed it down to see what happens. So I'm just going to let this run. So um, just kind of slowly, you can see what it does. It'll kind of you know turn left, move a little, and then 
run any of these box on the list, go back, turn right, run another any of these box. Let me just make it a little faster by turn, turning off visible stepping so I can run this a couple of times and I get some random ends. And now the question that we ask kids, and this is actually how we uh, kind of, um, you know, what, ha what happens now? So now I, I just press the button and, and there are two V blocks in that list. So what, what will happen if I now run this procedure? Any idea? Any guesses? Double. Double. W. 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 Any other ideas? Let's just try it. I'm just going to click this. Oh, look. It, 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 there's kind of some random shapes. Sometimes it'll just do that. Um, oh, sometimes it'll kind of really go crazy. So we're getting, you know, a fractal um, because um, V can now kind of, you know, call itself. And the reason why it doesn't go on forever, like it could go on forever, but, you know, the reason is it's just some, some statistical probability. It's not going to actually go on forever. And the beautiful thing about, you know, this is we're showing two big ideas. And this is what the beauty and joy of computing is about. We're showing two big ideas in this thing. It's a list of procedures. That's procedurist data. Procedurist data is traditionally considered something to be very difficult to understand for beginners especially. Um, but here it's, it's kind of a visualization that's easy for even scratch kits to get. Procedurist data. And the other way is we're introducing recursion, right? Something that will call itself and, and the beautiful example of this is it doesn't even have to have a base case because the base case is just math. Um, so this is kind of the archetypical example. Um, let me just show you um, a few things. Um, so what we have in SNAP is, for example, 3 plus 4. And you know, if I click on this, I'm immediately getting an example. So I, so I, so I can try this. But I can also prevent this from being evaluated by putting it inside a ring. So now it's kind of you know, protected against being evaluated. And then I can go and I can call it again. Um, and now if I call it, I'm again getting 7. So why is this interesting? <laughs> um, and I can kind of call it with a parameter. Um, and I'm getting 8. So this is. You know, I, I can package something and I can unpack it again. And that's seemingly trivial. But what this actually allows us to do is higher order functions. We can pass in the block and evaluate it later. So we can build our own higher order functions. Um, so here's a map. And this is how map is defined. And we can take map and, for example, have a list. Um, you know, just the old one, two, three, four list, and map the times two function over this, and we get a list where each item has been transformed. Or we can have, since this is functional, we can have any function in there. Now this is going to be the square function. We can put in a function that makes a list, and we get you know, a list of lists whose first item is the square of the input number, or we can kind of go even crazier and make a list of lists of lists, which kind of turns out to be a table. So with these kind of simple, seemingly simple features, we can do pretty powerful things in, in computing. Um, and so this is really what um, the beauty and joy of computing kind of is all about. So. Um, let me show you just, just one more example of this very quickly. So this is supposed to be the building in, in which we are. Uh, the weather isn't so great, so I took this off the web. My own one didn't have enough colors. So here's an example of first class stuff. So we've got kind of this first class costume. And I can look at the pixels in that costume. And so I'm getting a table. You know, it's kind of almost 56,000 uh, rows of, um, you know, um, for columns, and obviously these are the RGBA columns. And so it's just a list. It's just a list of lists. So if it's just a list of lists, I can take my map thing and do something with it. Um, so I'm just going to you know, put the first item of the list in the second slot, um, put the second in the third slot, uh, put the third 
in the first slot and, and leave the last one, which is the, uh, the A, where it is. So this is a function. I'm going to put this function into map and see what happens. And it's going to take a little while. Oh, but here it is. And I can compare these two tables. And if I look at the first number, see this is 84, 120, 204. Now it's kind of rearranged, right? It's just data. Um, so what happens if I kind of redisplay this data? What's going to happen to the blue sky? Oh, look, I can make my own graphic effects. It's just high order functions. This is just map. This is to us what the beauty and joy of computing is all about. I'm going to leave it here to hand over to my uh, colleague, um, Bernardo Magoza, who's going to show you uh, kind of some more concrete things to do with Arduinos and um, with 3D plotting. <laughs> So basically, uh, you know, it's dangerous to mm, do a live demo. It's even more dangerous when you have hardware involved. And uh, I swear to God this was working last week. I presented it last week. <laughs> so I'll try it again. It didn't work 10 minutes ago. Uh, it might not work now. Let's try it. <laughs> the idea here is I have exactly the same uh, Snap environment, only that it's a modified version of Snap that lets you interact with Arduino boards, okay? So the first thing you do is you connect to the Arduino board, which I have here. It tells me it's been connected. And now I have a couple, I have a sensor here, and I have an LED here. I'll try to be really fast. Uh, so I can try to get the analog reading of uh, the pin where the sensor is connected. If I press on it, I'll get a value. So it works exactly like Snap, no difference. Uh, so let me try to plot this. To plot something, we need to have a sprite moving one step all the time, right? And basically, when the X position goes over the edge of the stage, I want it to set to the other edge, right? OK. What do I have to do with the Y position? I have to map it to the value of the sensor, right? So I'll just set Y to the value of the sensor. <laughs> and what if I put the pen down now? And of course, I'll need to clear the stage when, uh, when the sprite gets out of stage, right? Yeah. Okay, so if, now, if this was working now, you'd see my heartbeat, which you kind of do, kind of. Uh, and I can also map this to, again, the real world, and in the real world, I have this LED <coughs> that would be mimicking my heartbeat, if it all was working. Uh, I'll try, because these are very sensitive sensors, and they sometimes need to be under a bit of pressure and in, in darkness, so I'll try to Apply some pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of. Yeah. Do you believe me? I swear it's my heartbeat. <laughs> so what we can do is I'll show you a one minute video. Oh, what's going on? So this is a heart rate monitor. This is the, the LED. 
By the way, this heart has been coded in a language uh, that's another modification of SNAP called Peter Blocks. So the whole thing is made with blocks. Here I'm trying to get my heart uh, bumping. <laughs> I'm not very much in shape, so it just took around 10 seconds. And you can see that the graph did actually work. It, I'm, I didn't fake it, I swear. <laughs> I think I kind of uh, <coughs> broke the sensor by pulling the cables, I don't know. And so to finish the presentation, I want to show you what this heart looks like in beetle blocks. This is beetle blocks, and basically it's the same thing as uh, a snap, but now you have a 3D world here, and you have a beetle that receives your instructions, okay? So I can, for instance, have it repeat something 24 times and create a sphere behind it, okay? Cool thing about this is once I have my shape, I can download it as an STL and print it in a 3D printer or as an OBJ and use it in my game, okay? Uh, and since this is NAP, you can have your own procedures. You can have your own more complicated blocks. Uh, like, for example, this block that I built that generates a hard shape. Uh, I, of course, copied this uh, from Wikipedia. I looked for a function that draws a shape. I don't know the first thing about mathematics. Uh, and let me show you how it works. Now it was in, in turbo mode, but... And so basically the idea here is that blocks programming is serious programming and you can do pretty much everything. Uh, and I don't know if we have time for questions, I think. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. yeah? Okay. So yeah. I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yeah, uh, have you considered, I actually used to teach kids with Scratch, um, and it worked really well, but like after a while, they just kind of grew out of it, like they hit some wall. I could tell Snap is more powerful, but have you considered at some point offering a way to transition to text-based <laughs> programming, uh, like within the same school? Yeah, I mean, you even mentioned it was kind of like Scheme, you could... Okay, there's a question, uh, like what's the strategy to transition to progress from blocks-based coding to text-based coding? And I've kind of given talks on this uh, the other way around, like how do you progress from text-based code to uh, blocks-based code? Um, so uh, you, know, you gotta watch out for the motivation behind this. Uh, so once you realize that you know, working with blocks in a live environment, you're actually working at the AST level of a <coughs> programming language. You're actually modifying a script as it is running. This is something no text-based language will let you do. It will, there's, there are live coding languages, but they will only, you know, refresh after the next loop, or they'll reset it and, and, and restart, you know, and in music they'll do it, you know, at the next beat or at the next bar. Um, so conceptually, um, I think we all know that text-based programming works. I mean, that's everybody, I mean, this is coded in text-based JavaScript, you know, underneath. But conceptually, there is no necessity. Uh, conceptually, there are interesting things if you take blocks to the extreme as we are. Um, and there are really two things about, about text-based programming that, um, um, well, three. First is because my dad is using it, right? Um, so I keep telling kids, you know, but uh, your dad's boss, you know, she's using Snap. Uh, you know, well, maybe at some point, uh, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and the other way is um, there are issues, of course, um, with the, we're looking up blocks in the palette. So this works great for, you know, 120 blocks. What if you've got, you know, 1,024 blocks and how are you even going to find them? So I could show you some more, but we've built something into Snap that lets you 
type blocks. So, you, the, so there's a typing mode, and you could just start typing, and then you get all the blocks. And, 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 and with just a few keystrokes, you kind of assemble a script. And I've been very inspired to, to do this, and basically to the point of almost copying it from Greenfoot, from Michael Culling and Neil Brown. Uh, their new uh, frame-based editing, as, as they're calling it. Um, the Stride editor ha has been a great source of inspiration to type more complex things. So, 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 so you don't have to use the mouse to drag it up. You know, start with the control palette, then go an F, then go to the operator's palette, drag out, you know, and it's, keep switching. So you're, if you already know there's something like that, you can type it faster. Um, that's kind of one of the main things for power use.